I'm Dan Kuvrat, uh, the publisher of Divorce Magazine and Family Lawyer Magazine. And uh, well, I want to thank you folks for watching or listening to today's uh, video roundtable and podcast. I'm confident that the information that will be shared by my uh, guests will be of tremendous value to you, particularly if you're going through a divorce that is a high asset divorce case, because these lawyers um, have dealt with many cases of that nature. Uh, I also want to mention that each state uh, treats divorce differently. So depending on the state that you're in, uh, the information provided may not be appropriate for your state if we get into nitty gritty. Um, so you need to talk with a lawyer from your state. And we've got lawyers from three different states here. But if you're not in one of those states, you need to talk with a lawyer from your state to get information specific to you. Today's roundtable is intended to give you insights into uh, like an overview of the subject of high asset divorce. So uh, with that in mind, all the attorneys that I've invited um, participating in today's roundtable are very, very experienced and accomplished. Uh, all are highly rated by their peers and their clients. And they are all have been and continue to be involved with their state bar associations, local bar associations, some with the national bar associations, and some with international family law associations. These are the cream of the crop folks. These are the top lawyers in their field. Um, and I can uh, have known all these people for a number of years in my role as a publisher of Family Lawyer Magazine, Divorce Magazine. I've been at this for 25 years. Uh, I can say that these are top, top professionals. And you certainly be wise to reach out to them if if you happen to be in Indiana, in Harrisburg, or in Long Beach. Uh, let me introduce my three guests. Maria Cognetti is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, a family lawyer who offers clients the benefits of her decades of experience, tenacity, thorough preparation. Let me underline thorough preparation and passion for justice in all family law matters. To learn more about Maria and her firm, uh, you can go to CognettiLaw.com. John Gilligan is in Long Beach, California, and John says there is no family law case he hasn't handled in some fashion over his 41 years of experience and 7,500 plus family law cases. Uh, to learn more about John and his firm, please visit GFTLawyers.com. Lastly, uh, Nissa Rickleford is in Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, Nissa provides compassionate and efficient counsel to help her clients make important decisions as they go through their divorce that will benefit her clients and their families. To learn more about Nissa and her firm, please go to bkrfamilylaw.com. So thank you all very much for joining me today. I look forward to, uh, to hearing your insights into um, how you how you help uh, divorcing people who have lots of assets and lots at stake. So John, let's start with you and talk about what is your approach when dealing with higher net worth divorcing clients? Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Uh, my approach, uh, first of all, when we're dealing with a high net worth divorce, you're typically dealing with someone who has substantial assets uh, specifically businesses. And the first thing that I want to do is get a hold of their tax returns. I want to get a hold of their personal, their corporate, their partnership, uh, their K-1s or 1099s, all of the specific uh, information concerning the income that they derive from those businesses. And usually we have uh, two types of spouses that come into my office. One is the spouse that runs everything, and the other, typically the man, but not always. And uh, the other spouse typically is is uh, at home, taking care of things at home, and possibly raising kids. We call that spouse the out spouse. Many times when the out spouse comes in and I say that I want those tax returns, they say, well, my husband would never give me those tax returns. Well, the first thing I say is, this is a community property state, and you typically file jointly on your tax returns, and even the corporate tax returns, you have a, uh, an interest in those uh, businesses that, that those tax returns represent. So therefore, you walk into the accountant's office and say, I am a client of yours, and I demand all copies, 
of all tax returns for all entities that have been generated. And uh, the accountant has a fiduciary obligation to provide those tax returns to you. That's the first thing that I want to see uh, because I want to develop an overall strategy of how we're going to attack this case. And uh, I get most of my information from those tax returns. So that's, that's the first thing that I do. All right. Maria, do you uh, have anything to add to that? Actually, I would just mirror something that John talked about when you've got John. I think you called it the out spouse. We would call it the dependent spouse. And so frequently they come in, as, as John said, and they've asked for those tax returns that John wants them to get, and the accountant has said no to them. So I want to reiterate to those folks to go back to the accountant who's filed your joint return for you and basically explain to them, if they think you're too stupid, that they have an absolute obligation to give you that information. Right. Nissa? I would just echo what both Maria and John said. It's amazing how uh, once someone retains an attorney and that attorney reaches out to the accountant, how then quickly all of a sudden the, the tune changes and you're able to hopefully informally get those documents without having to serve formal discovery. But I absolutely um, agree with John. It's about trying to gather as much information as quickly as possible regarding the finances so you can start working with your client to come up with an overall strategy. Uh, Nissa, what other professionals do you bring in to work with on a case when there's high assets involved? Well, John's already mentioned one of them, Dan, and that's that's the accountant. You want to start with the accountant who usually it's a business, knows the businesses inside and out. So you want to you want to establish a relationship with that accountant. A lot of times you're also going to talk with your client to find out if your client has been working with any kind of a financial planner. Uh, someone who's been maybe managing their portfolio, um, their investment advisor, their investment strategist, whatever you want to call that person. Um, but we want to reach out to that person to kind of find out to help us identify goals in the divorce. Um, what, what are the assets we'd like to keep? What are the most tax favorable assets? Which assets may be carrying um, loss, carry forward, those types of things. Um, and a lot of times when you're dealing... Um, with a, a couple and they've been using the same financial strategist, you might need to start looking at whether or not you need to get a new person involved um, that can work just primarily with your client. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times, as John mentioned, we have businesses. So we need to start thinking about, are we going to need to retain a business valuator um, to help us put a value on these businesses? And that leads into the question of, are we going to each have our our dueling experts, are we going to agree on a, on a joint um, business valuator? And there's pros and cons with both of those approaches. Obviously, how much money you want to spend, if you want to be sharing an expert, what happens if you don't like what that expert has to say. But those are probably the three primary individuals that we would start with. Maria, is there anybody else you would bring into the, into the case? Dan, I actually take a little bit of a different approach when you talk about a team because I look at it uh, from my end, I have both an internal team and an external team. My internal team is really made up of, believe it or not, my secretary, my paralegal, and myself. My secretary, because we all know that when you're dealing with a high-end client, they need a little extra hand-holding. They need to know that they're kind of special. And so your secretary has to be able to deal with that personality. My paralegal, I'm blessed because my paralegal has been with me for 30 years and she is probably brighter than most lawyers I know. And she, I let the client know that she will be working with them on a lot of things. Sometimes they're very happy to hear that because her rate is lower than mine. But they need to know about her so that they can have faith in her and know that when they have to deal with her, it's okay. And then I'm the rest of the internal team. But then I've got, as Nissa was saying, my external team, which is a, a little different. Um, basically, I start with a business valuator because that's probably going to be, generally speaking, one of the top assets. And our business valuators will not only do the business valuation, but also do the disposable income analysis if that's what we need done. That would relate to the alimony issue and also it's one of our factors in the divorce. Then I like to have lined up kind of in my pocket a number of real estate appraisers, both residential and commercial, depending on what the case involves. 
Finally, something that a lot of people don't think about and I find more and more is in a high-end case is the personal property appraiser. You know, in the average case, we have a personal property appraiser. They go into the house and they value the stuff. Um, in a high-end case, you need personal property appraisers who are used to dealing with kind of the, the collections, the artwork, the special things, the antique cars. And oftentimes you've got to reach out to some of the national associations to find the expert that you want. But back to Nissa's point about the CPA, I, I was glad you went there, Nissa, because it's so important, and, and John mentioned it earlier, it's so important to have that CPA ready to go for your client because if you have the dependent spouse, you know that the accountant that's been working with these people, who was friends with both of them perhaps, now sees the forest for the trees. He wants to end up with the money earning spouse, so he's not going to cooperate at all. So as Nissa said, I absolutely agree. One of the first things you want to do if you have the dependent spouse is line her up, sadly, her up with an accountant of her own that you can then deal with. And John, is that the strategy that you would take as well as get a get an accountant involved with the uh, out spouse or dependent spouse? And is there any other support that you would bring in? Do you bring in a mental health professional? Uh, is anything else that would be involved, John? Yes, uh, <clears throat> I, I agree with uh, what Nissa and Maria said. Um, it is important for me to get the forensic accountant hired first. Because even though we're in the Los Angeles area with uh, millions of people, there's very few forensic accountants that are worthwhile and reputable in our area. I could probably count them on the fingers of my both hands. And I want to make sure that I have secured the best one for my client before the other spouse has had an opportunity to secure that same forensic accountant. I want to get them on board right away. And uh, once that forensic accountant is on board, then yes, I may bring in a corporate attorney if I'm dealing with a publicly traded corporation with many shareholders. Uh, I may bring in a corporate attorney. I may bring in a tax attorney because there are specific tax consequences to transferring assets and dividing and, and dissipating shares of stock, things of that nature. And yes, if there's children involved and, uh, and the parties are having difficulties in formulating a parenting plan, I'll bring in a mental health professional to deal with the family, to try to get the uh, parenting plan established so I don't have to take that matter to court because nobody likes to try child custody cases. Right. So what I'm hearing from all of you is that where there's an imbalance in knowledge or could be about finances, could be about the business, could be even about you know raising children, you're going to bring, bring in top-notch professionals to help uh, even out that imbalance. Is that basically what I'm getting? Maria, you want to comment on that? Absolutely. I think we're all on the same page, even though we come from vastly different areas. Right. So Maria, is it, is it important to have an overall strategy when you are dealing with a high net worth divorce case, more so than when it's you know, you're dividing just a house and a, and a pension. Do you have to have more of a strategy when you go at it, Maria? Oh, absolutely, Dan. I, the two sets of types of cases are to be totally different animals. Um, excuse me. One of the first things that I like to do with the high-end client is basically to lay out for them. Now that we've talked about this team that we use, I like to lay out for them what I see as being the external team that we're going to need to bring into the case and also to make sure they understand how much that might cost them. Um, this is especially so when you've got the dependent spouse or the out spouse. Um, you need to confirm that that client who, generally speaking, if they haven't been involved in the businesses, they may not be as knowledgeable in some of this stuff. So you really need to confirm that they're on board with your approach, that they can buy into your approach and that they can afford your approach. How many times have we all had clients who have basically, even, even the really wealthy clients will sit here and say to you, gee, do I really have to hire that person or do I have to hire that expert? You know, I know what my business is worth. Can't we do it that way? So to me, I think that, you know, I work with a strategy that I'm comfortable with once I've assessed the case. 
and it's the strategy that I know works for me. So I need to make sure that my client buys into that strategy. So John, when you're thinking about strategy, yeah. is that finding out what the priorities for the client are? Is that your strategy, you're working in what's most important for them, John, or how do you go about it? I, I try to have a strategy in place uh, that the client consents to before they leave the office in my initial meeting. Ah. Um, I know that there's things I have to do to uh, find out more information, especially if the outspouse is the one that's uh, in my office uh, on her first appointment. And I'm saying her, but it could be a him, depending on who runs things. But uh, I definitely want a strat an outline strategy that, that the client is in agreement with before they leave the office. And that uh, basically entails both an in-house strategy, as Maria was saying, where they have met my paralegals, they have met uh, my staff, they feel comfortable with the staff, and then the specific professionals that I'm about to retain to uh, make sure that the status quo is maintained. The thing that you don't want to have happen is funny business going on right at about separation, where you see assets being transferred offshore or, offshore or to uh, strange accounts you want to make sure that the business, usually it's a business, uh, you want to make sure that that business is operating as it was prior to their separation. Because many times, unfortunately, the spouse that's in control of the business is going to do some divorce planning to try to minimize the exposure that that person has to pay the ex-spouse. So you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Maria. Can you give examples of how experience matters when it comes to a high asset divorce case? Sure, Dan. Actually, I think this question really ties in an awful lot with everything we've just been discussing. Um, your experience comes into play first in recognizing the high-end case. You need to recognize it in order to know how to plan it and how to deal with it. Then your experience assists you in recognizing what that case requires. Again, we've all talked about which experts to hire, how to handle the client. And if you don't do high-end cases all the time, I think it's very hard then when one comes your way to know what you're doing. Um, next is having the experience to pick the right people for your external team. Uh, I think we probably, I, I will guess we would probably all agree that not all experts are good for all kinds of cases. Um, I like to have a few business valuators that I work with, A, because sometimes the one you really like working with has already been hired by the other side, but B, because some bus business valuators are better at this type of, of business versus this type of business. Um, and the same is true for basically all of your categories of experts. So you need to know, use your experience to know which of your experts in each category that you really want for that case. But then there's really a whole second area of sorts where I think your, your expertise really matters. And to me, that's in the courtroom. Now, maybe that may be because I like being in a courtroom, um, shockingly, because I was very quiet growing up. But um, I think that when you're in a courtroom, oftentimes a judge, right or wrong, will judge your case and your client by you, by your demeanor, by your professionalism, your skills your preparedness. I know Dan made a comment at the beginning about how I tend to prepare a lot. Um, I prepare excessively. Uh, unfortunately, that means that in fairness to my client, I usually write off some of my time because I'm just crazy about being prepared for anything that come up. And so I think that that comes off in the trial or in the pretrial stage when the court can see that you know what you're doing you know what you're, you're dealing with, and it gives you kind of like instant credibility as far as, as the facts of your case are concerned. That's why, that last reason is why um, I like to make sure that I really kind of represent clients who I can do it like with all my heart and all my fervor, all everything. And so the last thing that I think your experience helps you with is to know when to not take a case. Right. John, Maria, as usual, was very thorough. Uh, is there anything you can add to that, John? Yes, Maria was very thorough, and I, and I echo those, those strategies uh, completely. 
very important to get your expert that you want on your case. So you want to contact them immediately as soon as the client leaves the office. Right. But another another thing that's important um, is that there are, because of the experience that I have in handling these types of cases, nobody in, in L.A. knows this. Well, usually the uh, inexperienced lawyers don't know this, but we can we have a procedure where we can run into court on an ex parte basis, which means an immediate basis, and have a court declare a particular high end case as a complex case. And when it is declared a complex case, the court knows it's it it's uh, a complex case and 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 uh, initiates immediate orders to prevent any funny business from happening. I like see. for example. Uh, the court will order immediate accountings being rendered to the non-operating spouse to make sure that the business is flowing as it was prior to the divorce. And also that spouse will know exactly what the income is, what the expenses are, and be able to uh, see some expenses that may be unusual. Uh, like for example, the operating spouse may be taking uh, substantial vacations with their new girlfriend. Uh, things of that nature that they're trying to run off, write off on the business. And uh, things like that uh, show up as red herrings in these uh, monthly accountings that the operating spouse is required to render under this under this code section, which uh, declares the case a complex case. So uh, that's one of the uh, tools that we use because of the fact that I've handled so many of these to make sure that the status quo is maintained. Because that's very important. To make sure that uh, there's there's no uh, funny business going on. Nissa, you have anything to add? Yeah, Dan. You know, I just kind of wanted to echo a little bit what Maria said. I think one of the things that you gain um, by having experience in these cases is that you are able to recognize um, and identify uh, what you don't know. Uh, we all like to think that we can walk into a courtroom and we've done these cases and we can be prepared, but I think experience really helps us understand that we need to rely on these experts. We need them to help educate us and we need them to be able to, to give us the lingo, for lack of a better word, that we need. As Maria said, when we walk in that courtroom, we need to have instant credibility and I'm just like Maria. I prepare, prepare, prepare because I know that walking in that courtroom, I'm telling a story and to be able to tell my client's story effectively, I need to be able to speak the lingo. I need to understand it. And I, most importantly, I need the judge to understand it. And from my perspective, that's where experience really comes in. Well, we've talked about business owners in a few different ways here. Are there any particular issues, Nissa, that the business owner uh, needs to address when it's, you know, is starting his or her divorce? Well, we talked about a lot of them, Dan, but one that hasn't come up yet is kind of that that confidentiality issue. Um, most of the business owners that I work with, one of their biggest concerns is they do not want their financial information to be disseminated in any way to any third parties or their spouse's friends or the people at the country club or, or the likes. So one of the things we do at the very beginning of the case is hammer out some type of a confidentiality and protective order um, that basically allows us to take all of this information we've been discussing, all of this very sensitive financial information, sometimes you're talking about trade secrets, those types of things, and make sure that it's protected. And that's going to require all of your experts to sign affidavits that they're not going to, you know, disseminate that information or share it in any way. Um, you know, our clients have worked really, really hard to get their businesses to the, the successful place. And we don't want to do anything in this divorce that is going to negatively impact the reputation of that business. And nobody wants it on the front page of the local paper uh, that, you know, this business owner is going through a divorce. So I would say taking some steps to protect confidentiality um, is one of the, the first things that we need to do and make sure that all of our experts are on the same page. John, anything you want to add to that? Yes, confidentiality is, is very important in this process and getting that uh, confidentiality agreement uh, signed by all the parties in your case, including the experts, is 
is extremely important. So I would uh, echo what uh, Nissa just said. But also, um, if the husband or wife or other spouse is a minority shareholder in a corporation or a minority partner, you may need to join uh, the partnership or the other partners or shareholders in your case so that the court has jurisdiction over them to make sure that they produce documents and, and uh, comply with the restraining orders imposed upon the court if your case is declared a complex case. Uh, it's no good to your case if your spouse is a 40% owner of a partnership, but the 60% partner is doing whatever he wants with the partnership. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that, that the court has jurisdiction over that 60% partner to bring him into the case to make sure that the court has enforceability to make sure the status quo is maintained throughout the pendency of the divorce. Maria, anything you want to add to that? I would support what they've both said about the confidentiality agreement. That's probably the key thing as soon as you get any request for information. But I would also add one, one small piece of advice. When you've got a business where even though, let's say, again, the dependent spouse has no interest in the business but has been running in and out of the office for years, befriending the staff, looking at whatever he or she wanted to look at, you want to tell your client to set, the, set their staff down and explain to them in a very polite way so that you don't involve them in the war, but how they need to deal with their spouse when the spouse starts making requests for information. John, what happens in a case in a business where they're both working in the business, but uh, they can no longer work together? Well, usually when uh, people get divorced, uh, their marriage uh, is terminated and also their business interests together are terminated. So typically we need to have a situation where one will buy out the other or the business will be sold and the proceeds will be uh, divided depending upon what their interest in the business is. I have very rarely seen in my 41 years uh, a divorce being finalized and the partners that have just divorced continue to operate the, operate the business amicably. Uh, so right. that typically doesn't happen. Now, another situation that come, sometimes arises is that your business is so successful, especially if it's a publicly traded uh, business. I, I handled the divorce of a, uh, a primary shareholder of, of a publicly traded corporation. And they simply did not have the financial wherewithal to buy out the other spouse. Uh, so therefore, the spouse had to stay on as a shareholder. Uh, but the spouse that was, that was staying on wanted to make sure that uh, her uh, shareholder rights were not being diminished or dissipated. So we had to uh, work out a situation where that spouse, even though she never operated the business, had no in no idea how the business was even run, we made sure that she remained a board member so that she attended all of the board meetings and she attended all the shareholder meetings and she had regular accountings uh, being given to her to make sure that everything was maintained and then her interest was adequately protected. Maria, anything you can add? I would say in my 45 years of doing this that probably a very small handful of times I've had clients come in Want, you know, the client that I was representing saying, yeah, we've decided we want to run the business together. And good or bad or right or wrong, I have done my best to talk them out of that. Um, you know, they, they're sitting here now and maybe it's a semi-amicable high-end divorce and they're getting along, but I try and explain to them, depending on their age, you know, what are you going to do when he has a girlfriend or when he remarries? Do you really want to be walking into the office at the same time? And try and talk them out of that because that is just disaster waiting to happen. The courts don't like it. The courts, if it has to go in through our court system, the court will do their best to convince them that the business should either be sold or given to one or the other in exchange for you know a, a conveyance of other property. But it's just a bad idea. Well, it sounds like another case where uh, experience uh, can provide good advice to your clients. Uh, Nissa, anything you want to add? You know, the only thing I would say, Dan, is I, I think something that when you have two people who are closely working in the business while a divorce is pending, 
um, it can be very helpful, I think, to try to make sure that everybody's on the same page about how those roles are going to continue and what business operations are going to look like as the divorce progresses. Sometimes you're going to have a spouse that says, I just can't do this. I cannot be in the same room with this person anymore. I can't do this every day. If that's the situation, then we need to come up with a plan on who's going to take over those responsibilities or what's going to happen. So just like we've been talking this whole session, I think it's kind of identifying what needs to happen and outlining a strategy of how to get there and making sure that everybody's on the same page. Right. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, Marie, and ask you a question uh, pre-divorce, and that would be about prenups. Um, I guess post-nups uh, could be after the marriage or would be after the marriage, of course, but um, what are the keys uh, to creating a great prenup, Maria? Thank you, Dan. As, as Dan knows, and um, John and Nissa may not know this, but like prenup is my middle name. Um, I, I like doing them. I enjoy doing them. And in preparing for this, I was trying to like decide why, why do I like them so much? And I think it's because over the 45 years that I've done this work, I've seen so many bad prenups that were done by uh, estate attorneys, corporate attorneys. Somebody got out of a form book. And I really feel the need to kind of right the wrong, right the ship or whatever, and try and get it right from the start. So when I'm doing a prenup, I kind of have five, five different areas or five things in mind. The first of which is, when's the wedding? If that's not the first question that your office asks when the prenup client comes in, um, it should be. And basically speaking, you know, it, it may be a really great case and you really want to take it and it's multi-million dollars, but the wedding's in a week, I'd probably take a pass because even if you think you can get it done, that's not going to be a good situation. So take a look at the timing and make sure that the timing actually works for us. Um, for the person who wants a prenup, get to the attorney as soon as it's even a thought in your head. Uh, the second thing I want to do with a prenup client is find out whether the other side knows, if they've shared this, this desire to have a prenup with their fiancé. Um, if they haven't, then I try and tell that client, please go and talk to your fiancé because, frankly speaking, you could spend a lot of time and money on me, and then you take a draft home and the person looks at you and says, over my dead body, the wedding is off. You've kind of wasted a lot of time. Plus, I think it helps them, the person who wants the prenup, to look more legit if they make it like a really open discussion. Once I've done that, and I'm sure that you know everybody knows what's going on, then I want to ferret out the client's, the client's goals. Uh, unlike a postnuptial agreement where everybody's got somebody who's been divorced, they kind of know what's happening, they know what the possibilities are, so many times a prenup client will come in and they don't really know what a prenup can accomplish. They think they do. But sometimes they don't even know that prenups work in both divorces and death situations. And then even if they know that, they don't know the wide array of things that it can do for them. So what I try to do at that point is to lay out for them, generally in that first or second meeting, a, a, an array of possible provisions for them to consider. You know, okay, you guys have a house together. What do you want to do? when one of you dies? What do you, want, what do you want to do when you separate? What if you have children by then? Um, what if one of you has been sick? You know, do you want it based on fault, which I always try to talk somebody out of. But you want to just give them the idea so that they can come back and say, okay, here's where I want to be. And what I'm looking for is that sense of uh, what I call the severity. What are they looking for? Do they want to absolutely give the other spouse nothing, or do they want to be reasonable? Um, being at least a little reasonable generally works better, um, but only once you know that and they know their options can you start to craft it. Then my last pointer would be that um, some clients will come in and they'll say, yeah, just draft this, give it to me, I'm going to go and get it signed. And I try to, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that in Pennsylvania, but I think we'd all agree that when the other side of a prenup, probably the dependent side of the prenup, has had counsel or hasn't gotten this document on the day before the wedding, has had time to review it. Um, and my prenups are generally about 40 pages long, 30 pages of which are the attachments showing that we've been open and honest. 
in Pennsylvania, there's no requirement to be fair at all, which is interesting. Um, but you just have to have had full disclosure. So that's what I emphasize when I'm putting a prenup together. Nissa, do you have anything you can add? Because um, I know you do prenups as well. Yes, thank you, Dan. Um, I guess in, in looking with prenups, I agree uh, with Maria. Um, anytime I, I see a prenup or someone comes in and it's three pages long and there's no disclosure or anything like that, um, I immediately want to say to them, you know, there, you have to do this the right way if you want the prenup to do the job for which the prenup is designed. So I always try to look at, you know, do we have complete disclosure of all assets and debts? Do we have clear, concise definitions of property? And do we have counsel on the other side? Kind of my three C's. I really think that, um, at least in Indiana, having a lawyer on the other side that that the other person has reviewed the draft with, they've had the opportunity to ask questions. It just goes a long way in being able to get that court to say from day one that this is an enforceable prenuptial agreement. John, anything you want to add? Yeah, a couple of things. In California, if, if there's not full disclosure, the prenup is not valid. So that's, that's the most important thing, that uh, both parties have fully disclosed all of their assets and debts and that it those assets and debts are attached to the agreement. Um, like in Pennsylvania, the agreement does not have to be fair. However, it's a lot more helpful if it is, or at least has some semblance of fairness. Because we have a Supreme Court case here, the Barry Bonds case, where Barry Bonds, who used to play baseball with the Giants, was married to his uh, Swedish model, uh, who didn't speak English very well, and he was on his way to Vegas to get married, and he stopped off, and he said, oh, by the way, I'm going to stop off at my lawyer's office so you can sign a prenup. That that went to the California Supreme Court, and it was thrown out because of the fact that, first of all, she didn't have any representation. It was done right before the wedding. She, she had uh, little uh, experience in speaking English, and it was basically unfair. She got nothing. He got everything, and there was a waiver of spousal support. So I want to make sure that there's an attorney on both sides that it has some semblance of fairness, even though it doesn't have to be exactly 50-50. And I want to make sure that there's full disclosure on both sides. And, and prenups are favored by our course of appeal. So if you do them right, they are upheld. Right. We're going to end this conversation with um, what people normally think of. I I believe when they think of a high net worth case, and that is that people are going to battle it out in court. John, what's your experience? Do people battle it out in court? And I'm, of course, going to give Maria and, and Nissa an opportunity to comment on this as well. What's, what's your experience and what's your approach to how to handle these cases? I try my hardest to get my clients to not battle this out in a public courtroom. Uh, we, can, we can hire a judge who's retired to hear this case and have it private. You can go through collaboration to try to uh, settle the case or a mediation. To, well, you, you, want to, you don't want to do mediation because that's, that's typically not going to work in a high complex uh, divorce case. But uh, you definitely want to stay out of the public courtroom. And the best example of that is, if anybody remembers the, the McCord case, the guy who owned the Dodgers, Neither of them stipulated to a private judge to hear their case. So they were in a public courtroom with hundreds of reporters in their courtroom every single day. And everything, all of their dirty laundry concerning the family came out on a daily basis. And it was headlines in the L.A. Times. We, we learned about Jamie McCourt's affair with her bodyguard. We learned about uh, Mr. McCourt's affairs and his uh, questionable business transactions that he had with the Dodgers. And uh, it was something that definitely should not have been handled publicly in a public courtroom. There are some states, there are some states that, ha that maintain privacy and secrecy uh, in family law court. California is not one of those states. We have a fully open courtroom. Anybody can walk in and watch whatever is going on in that courtroom. You do not want to have your complex case heard publicly in a public courtroom in California. Nissa, you have anything to add to that? 
I just would echo the same thoughts. Um, here in Indiana, we also have open courts, so you're not gonna get any level of privacy. Your dirty uh, laundry will be aired for all to hear. Uh, we do not have private judges in Indiana, so um, what I find to actually be one of the most effective mechanisms for finalizing these types of cases is actually mediation. And a lot of times we will do mediation with um, some of our experts also participating in the mediation to be um, helpful that day. Um, I find that these clients are very sophisticated and that they understand the negatives of, as I said, airing dirty laundry in a courtroom. So my experience is that more often than not, we will resolve this um, outside of court. It might take a while because it's complex, but we wanna make sure that we get all of the details correct so we can set these uh, people up for success going forward. Right, and that's an example of how different states operate differently and you look for solutions that work in your state. Maria, what about in Pennsylvania? How would you, uh, how would you describe what goes on I with your cases? Dan, I would mirror a lot of what John said about um, staying out of court. There's an additional reason that you want to stay out of court, at least here and that right now, and it really has not a lot to do with COVID, but just generally the way the court system runs and the fact that family law cases are not a high priority. But when you throw yourself into the court system, you're looking at massive delays. I will agree with John that Mediation in a lot of these cases is just not going to work. There's often way too high of a conflict level for that to work. Arbitration is a good idea. I'm in the central part of Pennsylvania. We have a lot of arbitration in the west and the east, not a lot here. But we do have an interesting court system that effectively helps keep you out of court. It's a three-part system where the attorneys go to the first meeting and lay out their case for the judge or in many cases, it's called a divorce master. We now don't even get judges in a lot of our cases. And the divorce master or the judge really kind of like helps you steer the case. Then the second step is what's called a settlement conference. And you have to have, and in between, they set all the deadlines for discovery. You have to have your case prepared and you have to have been talking, which kind of really replaces a lot of the mediation type theory. When you come to the settlement conference, the court wants to help you try and settle the case, which I think to a, a litigator, a civil litigator, that might be anathema to this whole thing. Like, oh my God, the judge is going to hear what the settlement offers are. They try not to really hear the settlement offers, but just to ask you if there's any impediment to the settlement. What do you need to know? What do you need to do? And then the last step is trial. But I will tell you that I would say that probably 90 plus percent of the cases that get into our three-part system are settled well before trial. But at least that keeps the case moving and keeps control over the clients. The master or the court keeps control over discovery so nobody can mess around with that. And it's really a good system. We also don't have private judges, um, which I learned about it at a conference I did with someone from California. Um, and I don't see us ever having that. So I think that what we have right now works as long as you're trying to make it work. You go to these meetings, you want to settle the case, which is what we should all want to do as much as I like courtrooms, but you want to settle the case and you convince the client they need to keep control over the outcome. The minute you go to that last step and you go to trial, like in any area of family law, you've lost control of the outcome. So settlement's always good. So I, I think we're kind of all on the same page where that's concerned. I want to thank all of you for joining me today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I encourage people who are watching or listening that uh, they visit the websites of Maria Cognetti, which is cognettilaw.com, John Gilligan's, which is gftlawyers.com, and Nissa Rickefort, which is bkrfamilylaw.com. I knew this before doing the interview with uh, these fine attorneys, but they are tops in their field. And I think you uh, can gather from what we've been talking about that they, uh, their experience is invaluable, uh, but also their personalities are invaluable. These are people who love what they do and uh, they all dig in and help their clients way beyond what their clients could expect that they would do. I know that from uh, having dealt with them over the years. So I wanna thank them again for joining me. I encourage you to look into these lawyers if you're if you're going through a divorce, thinking about a divorce, or know somebody who is, 
And uh, you may also even contact them because uh, even if you're not in their state, they may know somebody else in another state who can help you who is at their level because they're all well connected across the country as well. So thank you folks for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Dan. Thank Thanks, you, Dan. Dan.